so I'm assuming you all can see my screen here. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll go over a code I wrote um, oh, almost two years ago now. Um, full disclaimer, this code was something I wrote maybe in the first or second week of my PhD. Um, so it's quite old and it could certainly be improved a lot, but it gets the job done. So I apologize for some weird or crazy things that you might see in there um, as I go through it. And it could definitely be commented more, there could be more notes. But anyway, um, basically the idea here was simple. Um, I'm working on some magma body crustal deformation stuff. And we wanted to just basically benchmark a finite element model that I had going. And uh, this paper here has some semi-analytic solutions for um, deformation due to a pressurizing, um, basically penny-shaped crack, a sill in an elastic half space. So this is kind of what we used to um, benchmark my model. Um, there's a lot of stuff in here, which I didn't implement all of it. We were specifically focused on at the time, just the surface deformation. So there's some kind of nice approximations and stuff you can make to just worry about the surface deformation here. And those kind of pop up here. So these are the eventual equations that I implement. Um, but to do that first, we need this um, big phi and psi. And to get those, these are over here. And to get those, we need this little phi and psi. And um, to get those, uh, there are a couple ways this paper chose to do it. But the way I chose was basically if you have um, a constant pressure in your magma body, basically your pressure isn't spatially dependent, you can go down and pull uh, these guys, these equations here from Appendix A, and that's where I started in my code. So let me show you that. Okay, so here's my code. It could be commented better. Um, it could also be implemented a little bit better, but again, it gets the job done. Um, so first, I just implement these kernel functions here um, that if I go back to the other screen, you see are going to be needed for this phi bar and psi bar. Um, one thing you might notice here is that they're implicit. Uh, the definition of these two functions depends on phi bar and psi bar. So basically, you can solve this iteratively, which is what I ended up doing here. If I go back. So that's what happens in this step. And um, I ended up interpolating these um, for a SciPy integrate. Sometimes it could be nice to have a, a, an interpolated function to integrate over. It's not the fastest way. It's probably not the cleanest way. But basically, that's what I did. I um, iterate through um, some range. I set a maximum iteration range here of 100. It, it doesn't reach 100. And then a tolerance um, that's just basically the previous solutions and the new solutions, if there was in that tolerance, and they'll say my solutions have converged and I can move on to the next step. Um, so basically I start, they start with just these two base cases um, for phi bar and psi bar. Psi bar starts at zero, phi bar starts at this. I interpolate them and then I loop through these t's here. So if I go back, um, we integrate over this uh, variable r, but it's a function of t essentially. And later, if you go up to, yeah, big phi, big psi, you're going to uh, integrate over this variable t. So I want to basically solve, um, have these phi bar and psi bar go from t goes from 0 to 1, and also r go going from 0 to 1. Um, so that's essentially what I do. I have, I set, basically, I iterate through all the t's and set each t in the phi bar and psi bar. Um, I set this integrand here, which is just a nice little Python um, lambda function, uh, which is, so every element of my phi bar and psi bar is just this integrand. If I integrate over this integrand for every element here, and uh, same for psi bar, and then I figure out this tolerance. This is actually maybe not the best variable name for this, but I just use, I could have used like an L2 norm or something. I think this is infinity norm, just literally taking the absolute value of the difference between my current phi and psi and the previous iteration of, of phi and psi. Again, this works. Maybe not the best way to do it, but this is just the quick and easy way. And if they are um, above those tolerances or that max tolerance that I set up here, then they haven't converged. If they're below them, then they've converged. Um, and then once we've converged, here I'm just printing out each iteration step. It only takes seven iterations for um, these variables, mainly the array size. Um, with a larger array, basically I get smoother solutions, but 
and the solutions are smooth enough for what I'm doing. But anyway, it only takes seven iterations, then we can move on to the next step. Um, actually, here I just plot this phi in Cybar uh, as a sanity check. Let's see, where are they? Yeah. So um, for various, yeah, depth to radius ratios h, we expect these curves here for phi and phi and psi bar as a function of t, and um, basically just check that. I forget exactly what h I'm using, but when I was doing this originally, these were what I would have expected. So basically, this is just a check. I'm on the right track, and I've done my iterative solver correctly and have found my phi and psi bar. Next up, I just want to get big phi and big psi, which again are these two equations here. And I just iterate over in the, the function of um, C, which will be plugged in over here, but I just integrate over this variable T. And um, again, I kind of interpolate, I have these interpolated phi and psi bar functions. So I could use um, psi pi integrate. Um, there are other probably quicker ways to do this, but this is just at the time the way I decided to integrate over these and plot them. And then after that, I can just go and get the solutions for my vertical and radial deformation at the surface, which are these. Um, I have almost everything I need here. I'm integrating again over this variable C. Um, the only, the only um, kind of tricky thing here is that we have um, these spherical Bessel functions, um, which you want to integrate over. Luckily, psi pi has spherical Bessel functions implemented into it. So I just go at the top of my code here, I um, imported psi pi special, which has uh, my spherical Bessel functions of the zeroth and first order, which I can just go integrate over um, like this formula here shows. And once I get those, which these actually take quite a while on um, this, um, these integrations are not the most, again, probably not the most efficient way to do this. I go out to an r value of phi. This is a normalized r. I think it's r over h. Um, I'll plot the normalized and um, dimensional plots of these in a second. But basically, I just integrate over all, all of these for my values of r. I use numpy vectorized, which is, I guess, a fancier way of doing what I did up here, just going through. Basically, it loops through every one of these variables. So I use vectorize and then plug in this r. Uh, variable here, which again goes from zero to five in these non-dimensional um, units, and it goes out, and then I can make these nice plots. And let me see, yeah, I, I'll compare these. I'll show you um, in a second um, these plots versus my actual model, which I used to benchmark. But here we have these plots. Again, the only tricky thing here is there's some weird, and it's actually not really apparent in the paper. But the way to non-dimensionalize these, it involves um, the radius of your magma body times the pressure over, um, you know, over your shear modulus. But you can get this nice normalized displacement plot for the vertical in blue and the radial in orange, and then this dimensionalized uh, displacement plot. And if I go over here, um, these blue dots are my model output. So I have these finite element models that I'm interested in. And kind of the first test, you just make a fully elastic model and basically, I can use this analytical solution to go check and say, OK, is um, my uh, meshing good enough? Is, do I have a fine enough mesh? Um, are my dimensions large enough such that it adequ adequately um, um, simulates uh, uh, semi-infinite half space? Or am I going to run into boundary issues at the edges of basically my rectangular mesh? And you benchmark here, and basically my displacement, my vertical and radial displacement at the top center of my um, model match pretty well the kind of analytical or semi-analytical solution that I implemented. So that's basically what I use this for, just as a check on my models to make sure I was developing my finite element model correctly. Um, but yeah, that is the code I have. It could be commented better. It could be implemented faster, I think, if I were to do this now. I would maybe do things a little bit differently, but this was first two weeks of PhD in me um, trying to implement this paper. But uh, yeah, any questions or comments, or I can go through the paper a little bit more, but um, that is the code I have. Yeah, that's awesome. Not bad for your first two weeks of your PhD. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, 
I, I do have some questions. I, I, yeah. I, I don't actually, I didn't. So, so you're, you're modeling a, basically a penny shaped sill here. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, I think so, so a, go ahead. Here. Yeah. This is kind of a cartoon outline of what I'm modeling. Uh huh. Okay. And the, and, and is it in a deviatoric, is it in a stress field that's specified or is it just um, isotropic and horizontal dimensions or do you control that? Yeah, so the solution I did, it, it is in a lithostatic um, state of, lithostatic stress field and you can actually have um, spatially, de uh, spatially dependent pressure, pressurization on this crack. Um, I didn't do that for mine, that involves a little bit more complicated expressions for this phi and psi here, um, which you can see yeah. we have this delta P as a function of R. Um, right. For my models, I have a uniform pressurization, basically a, a uniform normal pressurization on the walls of my cracks. So I don't need to use these, I can use the simpler versions. But in general, well, this paper does have the semi-analytical solution for um, a non-uniform stress, non-uniform pressure on um, the magma body. Totally, totally makes sense. <clears throat> and and can you go back to your solution for um, the uh, way way back at the beginning? I can't remember the name of the variable. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> use phi and psi bars. Phi, phi bar and psi bar. Mm -hmm. So so um, if I understand this correctly, what you're doing is you're iterating to get um, a convergent solution to so basically to both integrals, yeah. you're finding the solution that satisfies both integrals for your input parameters, right? Yeah, so these variables are only defined implicitly. And so you yeah. don't have your base conditions, but yeah, I'm just iterating until I get a convergent solution for these. Um, mm -hmm. These mm -hmm. equations, yeah. Yeah, that's a nice use of uh, the lambda function. Yeah, it was... It took a lot of trial and error, but this was this was kind of my first foray into using these, um, Python lambda functions, and it was kind of a nice way for me to write it out. Right, right. So um, cool. That's 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 super super nice. Um, I have a question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you assume that the pressure inside your penny shape uh, dike is actually greater than the than the ambient pressure that the pressure that is in the in the surrounding media, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's basically I'm not. So whenever I talk about a pressurization in this in this um, magma chamber, this so I'm just talking about an increase in pressure from whatever the ambient pressure is. Okay. All right. Have you uh, compared this with Pollard solution? Pollard solution. Um, I'm not sure. Dave Pollard had a, had a um, penny shaped crack model back in the 70s. So I was just curious. Oh, really? No, I yeah. haven't, but I, I'm interested now. I'll look that up. I wonder. Uh, I think he was Paul Siegel's advisor, right? Oh, okay. Um, and and uh, I, I I may have that wrong. Apologies if I've got that wrong, but I um, I think so. And um, they did a lot of really nice early work on penny shaped cracks um, as models for magma bodies um, mm -hmm. using the uh, Henry Mountains and. Um, uh, other volcanic fields in the western U.S. and sort of analogs for their dikes and stuff like that. And I think they, um, uh, I think their solution is still pretty widely used. And I was always curious how the Fialco solution, um, if I'm pronouncing that correct, his name correctly, yeah. is how that compares with the Pollard model. Um, but I mean, if you're getting good good results with Pylith, then I imagine. Um, they must converge. Yeah. Pretty well. Yeah. I'll have to take a look at that. Yeah. Interesting. So, um, so you went on what, so, so why did you go with the pile? So, so pile is a, um, 
uh, I haven't used PyLeft, but my understanding is it's a pretty nice uh, finite element code for geodynamic modeling. Um, yep. And, you know, so if you're interested in, you know, whether you intrude a magma body into the crust, will the crust sag and uh, yep. uh, with that additional weight or what? I mean, it's a it's a nice model. Why, why are you going with PyLeft? Yeah, that's that, basically kind of that, that's, that is kind of the idea of what we're looking at. We're looking at a couple <laughs> systems in um, basically trying to understand uh, the role of mush zones or um, some sort of viscoelastic compliant region around a magma body, what that would look like when you're looking at surface deformation. And so, yeah, Pilot is, well, first of all, it's free, which is nice compared to things like Cosmo and, and stuff. But it's, it just gives you oh, yeah. a lot of good control over geometry. It has a nice viscoelastic implementation, has a good poroelastic implementation. Um, so it gives us a lot of flexibility to kind of investigate different geometries um, and kind of come up with these ideas of mush zones and um, what that might look like at surface. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, so, um, but does Pyleth actually have, I mean, it doesn't actually model the temperature distribution explicitly, right? Oh, that's a good point. So actually, I'm going to be going to the Pilot Hackathon in a couple months, and my goal will be to um, implement a temperature field into Pilot's um, max um, viscoelastic power law implementation. So yeah, hopefully. So yeah, right now we just kind of have a time independent um, viscoelastic or poroelastic region um, around our magma body. But the next step, next kind of step, would be to have more of a time-dependent Bezier intruding that magma into the magma body and doing that through um, the temperature field. And you mean you can set the temperature in pilots yeah. uh, viscoelastic power law, but that temperature is not time-dependent currently. So that's right. hopefully right. I'll implement that into pilot. Um, this oh, year. that's that's super interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, cool. Any other questions for Grant? I mean, that was a that was a quick summary of a really complicated uh, <clears throat> research area. Um, you know, feel feel free to ask questions about it yeah. if, uh, especially if you're a little lost, <laughs> just go ahead and ask some questions because it is uh, easy to get lost with this kind of model. Yeah. Implementation. If you think of questions later, you can always Slack me or something. Happy to. Nice. Okay, so so um, super cool. Okay, and so you you sorry, I'm I'm actually not running Jupiter right now. Did you upload this to the? Um, well, not I can do that or talk to somebody. Yeah, it's um, clean enough. I think I can upload it to Victor. Um, yeah, why don't you do that? Because I mean, uh, you know that it it'll probably be yeah. used by a lot of people if yeah. uh, you're willing to share that code. It would be great. Oh yeah, and you know maybe people can um, take a shot. I'm sure, or... people can improve on improve on it. So yeah, <laughs> oh, it's a nice. good alternative to the Moggy one. So I think you know it's it's that's interesting to have these. <laughs> oh, for sure, it's a good alternative to Moggy. I mean, it it, yeah. it um. Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, it would be it would be interesting to, um, you know, in in like the San Rafael swell, we've almost got the inverse problem where we know a lot about the magma and the you know from Orly Germa's work and and the thickness of the sills, mm -hmm. and it would be it would be interesting to know you know well what kind of deformation accompanied the emplacement of those sills. I mean, yeah. supposedly they're eight hundred meters below the paleo surface. You know, yeah. forty meter thick sills. <clears throat> so it's pretty pretty interesting. Yep. <clears throat> um, all right. 